um, I can here. Okay. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Megan Rooney. My internet is acting funny. Can you hear me? Lisa, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay. Um, Media and our co presenter today is Lisa Carey, who is also Hi. with our organization. And we are here to talk about clearly communicating numbers and essential strategies for talking about how people uh, interpret and understand numbers and how we can best communicate them. Oh, and Lisa, you can go ahead and share the slides. Okay, and Megan, your um, your audio is kind of going in and out a little bit. Um, maybe you could call in to the meeting. Can you do that, um, or yeah, you know, this you know, keeps going. Lisa, could you let me switch my internet? I'm sorry, everyone. Just started on the first couple of slides, and we'll be right back. Okay. 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 Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. Let's see here. Okay, can everybody see my screen now? Looks like, here we go, okay. All right, so um, clearly, welcome to Clearly Communicating Numbers and Risk, um, essential strategies for talking about numbers and risk. And um, we've already, as we already asked you, go ahead and as you're joining the meeting, Please type your name, your role, and your organization in the chat. And let's go ahead. And this, this is being recorded. So uh, you will be able to see it um, at some point later on, or colleagues you have who were not able to join today. Um, so welcome, everyone. We're here from Health Literacy Media, or HLM for short. And we're working with the Kansas City Health Department to develop a series of workshops, um, as well as health materials for you, and covering topics such as clear communication, talking about COVID-19 with consumers um, and vaccines and much more. So my name is Lisa Carey. I'm the Senior Health Literacy Writer and Training Manager here at HLM. And um, I've been with HLM for about eight years now, working with Megan. And Megan, are you able to join us now and introduce yourself? I think I am back. Let me know though, Lisa, if there's other issues. Okay, no, you sound clear. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I'm the Director of Creative Programming at HLM, and I have been with the company for about 12 years now. So, um, just been leading our team in terms of health literacy strategies and numeracy and risk strategies. And Lisa and I have had a lot of experience learning about how people, <clears throat> especially adults, learn best and, um, and learn health information and numbers specifically. So that's why we're here to talk with you today. So Lisa, I can take it from here. Um, before we begin, uh, you are muted. And if you do want to say anything, please speak up. Please unmute yourself. We'd love to hear from you. In the next day or two, you'll be getting a summary of the training today and also a link to a short survey we would love if you could fill out. Um, 
You can turn your camera on so we could see your faces. You can use the chat if you ever want to ask a question or, or discuss or answer a question. And like I said, please unmute yourself. We'd love to hear from you. So let's get started. We're first going to define numeracy. The word numeracy itself is jargon. So let's actually talk about what we mean here. So numeracy is the ability to understand and use numbers in daily life. Um, it sounds pretty simple, but actually once you start to learn about it, you realize we are faced with numbers all the time. <clears throat> and people in general have very low numeracy skills, especially adults, adult learners. And so numeracy is an important part of health literacy, <clears throat> which many of the trainings in this series have been about different health literacy topics. And we know that health literacy is a very strong predictor of health outcomes. Examples of numeracy would be paying your monthly bills, things that we all do and we take for granted, estimating out-of-pocket health insurance costs, understanding how much medicine to take, and then calculating your risk, which people have had to do a lot in the last two years um, regarding COVID. You know, do we know when do we wear a mask? When do we not? Is that event okay to go to? Can my children go back to school? These are all risk calculations. So what is risk? It's the probability that an event will happen or affect someone such as getting COVID. The CDC describes four types of risk and it's a nice framework to, to think about this kind of large concept of risk. The first type is a, a threat or a harm like smoking. Smoking is a risk to your health. Um, it can also be an outcome an event of an event. So you're at risk for heart disease. If you do these things, you're more at risk for something. It can also refer to risk factors. So what are the things that make you more likely to get a disease or have a certain outcome? So diabetes may be a risk factor for long COVID. And then there's also the likelihood of, of an event even happening. So people who are unvaccinated have a higher risk of severe illness. So there's kind of four ways to think about risk. And this is just a little hint we like to share that risk can often be replaced with the word chance, not all the time, um, but especially in that, that fourth bullet that we just talked about, People who are unvaccinated have a higher chance of a se severe illness. It works perfectly in that case. And we have found that, that, you know, it's, we always talk about jargon and eliminating jargon from our language in the health field. Risk can feel very jargony to people in certain circumstances. And when you think about the way people speak, they often would say chance, you know, oh, it gives me a higher chance of this, not a higher risk. So in the public health field, we think about risk, we use the word risk. So we're just mentioning that to really critically think about how you're using that word and if it can be replaced. So examples of risk, someone's personal risk of getting heart disease, <clears throat> risk of side effects from a treatment or a vaccine, which we've heard about a lot over the last couple of years, and risks and benefits of a surgery. We have a little activity to start just to um, try and demonstrate the demand of numbers. So we're going to show you some dots that should be popping up here. And we want you to count the dots. And type it in the chat when you get your answer. Okay, a lot of answers coming in. Eight. I did this the other day and I counted nine. I and then it took me a minute to go back and and look because of the way they're arranged. So everybody's getting eight, which is correct. Um, so it, it it was pretty fast, but it did take you kind of a second. You had to make sure that you got every dot. So um, let's show you the next pair of dots and please count these and add your number in the chat. Right, five. 
five is correct. Um, the answers did come a little bit faster. And did you feel that the second time it was, um, it, it took you less time to actually count those dots? Most of the responses are yes. Okay. So studies show that the human brain can see at a glance six or fewer items. So if there are seven or more items, the brain must actually count them. The, the brain can't just kind of look and estimate or, or guess. The brain has to actually go through and count each dot once you're over seven items. This is also why phone numbers are seven numbers. There's research going far, far back that we can remember about seven items. And so this is just a, a way to demonstrate the demand of numbers, the demand of counting, it takes a lot more energy for our brains to process numbers and to look at numbers than it does images or even simple words. Um, so keeping that in mind, just that numbers are demanding, but also you wanna be careful about how many numbers you're presenting to people, how many concepts you're presenting, keeping that number of seven in your mind, fewer than seven, or is this seven or more, you're starting to overload people once you get closer to seven. So we would like to hear from you before we start in, um, what types of numbers do you use with your clients? So where do you see people struggle? Um, what, what are the demands on you to explain numbers, numeracy, risk? Where are people struggling? I'll give you a minute to throw some answers in the chat. Isolation times. So how, when to isolate, how long to isolate, if you've had an exposure. Number of COVID cases per specific population. This gets very complicated because you're comparing different numbers in different regions and you're comparing different um, you know, numbers with different denominators, which can be really hard for people. Um, Grace says we see people struggle with the risk of getting their five to 11 year olds vaccinated. So that's, you guys are really getting at those four types of risk. So that's one of those types where you have to weigh the risks and benefits and explain to people and then have them kind of sit with that and, and interpret that. Um, probability of being unvaccinated and living with HIV. So what are the risks that come with having HIV and not getting vaccinated. <clears throat> okay, yeah. So a lot, it sounds like a lot of risk and then a little bit of like, <clears throat> excuse me, numbers, um, data, and then some behavioral information like when to isolate, how long. Risk of not getting the booster, right? So again, helping people understand the pros, the cons, and how that makes sense in their life. Very good, thanks. So we'll move on, just a little background about low numeracy. 30% of US adults have numeracy levels at or below level one. And what is level one? These, these are people who can do simple math, like 10 plus 10, understand simple percentages, very simple percentages. Percentages are very hard for people, so they have to be really simple. And then simple common graphs and visuals. And we have an example here of something that is very, very simple that people might be able to understand. So which treatment takes longer to work? You're comparing two treatments. And then on the left, you've got the number of months. So people at the lowest level of, num level of numeracy can typically do you know, interpret this type of data. What they cannot do, <clears throat> simple math with decimals or fractions. Decimals are very confusing to people, especially people with very low literacy because they are periods. And so if they don't have the numeracy experience, it just looks like a period to them. Fractions also aren't typical. They're not something that people see a lot. They don't know how to compare fractions of different denominators. Um, 
They cannot estimate an amount based on a situation like how much, how many gallons are left in a tank if you see your dial in your car. And then the last thing is interpret simple data in tables. So we have an example, which group had the highest average score after completing their diabetes class? What you have to do here is add up and divide by three and take the average of each column. And that would be very hard for most people to understand what mathematical equation is necessary, but then actually then doing the math. So we have a quick example here. Here's a typical instruction someone might get with their medication. Take half a teaspoon once per day, plus one fourth of a teaspoon three times a day. So try to do this math. How much total medicine would you take in a day if you follow this instruction? You can type it in the chat. Okay, see a couple, yeah. Yeah, that's right, about one and a quarter. It takes you a second though to do that, right? And we, you know, work in public health. We, you know, the audience for this training, you all probably have higher levels of numeracy um, just because of the nature of your work and what you do um, and the work, you know, the people that you work with. So, you know, if it takes you a second to think through that, you know, imagine people who are under stress or don't have the education level, um, they're sick. That's when numbers become a real challenge. Um, let's move on to our next section. So we are going to use a story. We're going to use Roberto's story. He's on the next slide to demonstrate the demands of risk and numeracy on a typical patient or person. And then we, at, after we tell his story, we'll go into what strategies could have helped him along the way. So Roberto is 54 years old, lives in Kansas City. He's recovering from a severe case of COVID. He has not had his vaccine. He is hospitalized, but now is being discharged. The experience was overwhelming for him. He's trying to get settled at home with his family, but he's still having some symptoms. So we'll be talking about Roberto and how he encounters numeracy and risk during his whole recovery. So as he's being discharged, these are his instructions. There's four. Pick up your new medicine. Keep okay, an eye on your oxygen. Something. What was that? I think someone said something. Mute my audio. ATL plus A. That's okay, I'm going to keep going. And please send us a chat if you need to uh, to ask us a question or, or say something because I couldn't quite hear that. Um, pick up your medicine, keep an eye on your oxygen tank, wear a mask in public, get vaccinated. We'll move to the first instruction. Pick up your new medicine from the pharmacy. So Roberto is dropping off his prescription at the pharmacy. He learns his medicine is listed as mm -hmm. 175 before mm -hmm. insurance. Mm -hmm. He has met his deductible for the year, which means he only needs to pay his co-insurance of 20%. So I'm going to launch a quick poll here. This should pop up on your screens. And it asks you how to choose one of the three options. How much does he owe? If this isn't popping up for you, it might be because you don't have the newest version of Zoom, but we'll show you the answer if you can't see the quiz. I see the answers kind of trickling in still. Some people are putting their answer in the chat. Yeah, this is um, this is hard. I I couldn't. I tried to do this, and I had to write Lisa and say, "Can you check the numbers?" Because I 
I'm not, you know, I believe that I have low numeracy. I have really struggled with numbers. And as I couldn't do this, I would have to like sit down, use a calculator, use a pen and paper. Um, so we all struggle differently. So I'm going to share the results with you. Most of you said 35, some of you said 140. And then, yeah, we have a 35 in the chat. So Lisa, you can show the answer, which is 35. Um, like I said, there's a lot of numeracy involved there. And I, actually, I think we, yeah, we discussed it on the next slide, so I won't tell you, but um, there's a lot of numeracy involved in this task more than you might think. So he has to know the word deductible. He has to know the word coinsurance. He has to know what those mean in the context of the numbers. So Cohen, you know, if your deductible is met, it means that you don't have to pay the cost of the medicine, but you still have your coinsurance, which is 20%. So it's going to be 20% of 175. So that right there is a really like sophisticated skill. Um, he must know what percents mean. We take for granted that we, most of us feel like we understand what a percentage is. Some people do not. And he must know how to do the actual equation. So how do you even take 20% of 175? Um, again, a lot of us can take for granted that we know how to do that simple math, but a lot of people don't. So Roberto thinks that his medicine will be the full 175. He's afraid he can't afford it and he doesn't pick it up. So what could have helped Roberto here? And you can just think through it or throw your answer in the chat. What could have made this easier for him? I'll give you a minute to think about it. I'm simply stating how much it would be, telling him, him how much he will owe. Yeah, which I have the pharmacy tech explain the cost, that's great. Counseling when his prescription is dropped off, right? So someone there to walk him through it, to explain it. If the pharmacy told him the exact coinsurance instead of 20%, right? So, so telling him the actual number, so this required him to do the math. So it sounds like you're saying, why well, put that burden on the patient? The math could be done for him. The pharmacy would not tell him the percentage. They would only tell him what he owed. So in our story, you know, for the purposes of this, this is what the, the pharmacist told him, but yes, in an ideal situation, someone there at the pharmacy would explain the numbers and actually just tell them the cost, great. So he wasn't able to check off the first item, so we'll move to the second. So keep an eye on your new oxygen tank, call if it needs to be refilled. So Roberto is looking at the handout that came with his oxygen tank. And I'll give you a minute just to scan this. And you probably just, you get the idea by looking at it. So there's a lot of text. It's probably really small. There's a small black and white illustration that looks pretty complicated. The instructions are also in English and Roberto's first language is Spanish. The action step is buried in the middle. So call the oxygen tank company when the tank reaches 30%. So the numeracy skills required here are, he has to, yeah, he has to read the numbers on the gauge. He has to compare it to the handout. Um, he has to understand what 30% means. Again, so percentage is being difficult. He has to understand what 30% even is on the gauge. You know, is there a 30% mark or does he have to do the math to take 30% off, you know, or to take, I guess, 70% off of the 100%. So a lot of skills required here. What could have happened differently here? How could, how could this have gone differently for Roberto?
a color marker on the tank that shows them when it needs to be filled exactly. And so we'll talk about that in the strategy section is that oftentimes just a simple visual with numbers is all that people need. Most people are visual learners. Most people are helped by pictures and images. Um, it also is more engaging. So it's just kind of easier in general to look at something that's a nice picture. Um, so Grace said, include a photo. So when his tank matches, he knows to call. That would be great too. A picture of what a 30% tank looks like versus what a new tank look, looks like. And then when he gets there, he'll know. That's great. So you're saying colors and images. That's great. Um, instructions should be in English and Spanish. Clear visual, you said, and um, let's see. And there could be labels is another idea, is putting labels on the picture. So Roberto called the company when it lowered by 30%, not when it was at 30%. So percentages can be interpreted completely differently by different people. He called too early, the company won't come out, he's confused, frustrated, and possibly even might run out of his, his oxygen tank. So real health implications. So how likely is it that Roberto will call again? You know, if you're feeling embarrassed, if you're feeling like you didn't do it right, you know, you feel like you don't know how to do this, you're not going to be as inclined to call again and to really advocate for yourself. Um, shorter instructions, teaching him before he goes home, of course. So the support needed before you just send the patient home. Um, could have provided training at the hospital before he left, have a rep from the company who distributes the tank. Exactly. So I've heard you say changes to the physical gauge and the physical instructions, as well as emotional and instructional support as he's being given the tool. So I love all those ideas. So we'll move to the third task now to wear a mask in public when cases are high. So Roberto would like to attend his daughter's band concert in an auditorium and is deciding if he should wear a mask. So here's what, here's the risk assessment. Here's what people have to do to assess their risk. And this is very complicated skill. Um, so to be proactive, he looks up the COVID numbers in his community. He sees that there were 206 cases last week but he doesn't know if 206 is high or low. Next, he sees the total number of cases is lower than it was during that spike in the winter. So he can see the visual, which is nice. He can see, okay, it was really high during that bad peak. Now it's low. You know, it seems pretty good, but, but I really just don't know because numbers themselves don't give us much meaning unless we're, we're paying attention to the numbers every week and we have the context. So how is numeracy and risk involved in interpreting this data? I'll let you just think about what are the skills that he has to have to do this? What does Roberto have to know how to do to look at that graph, to look at those numbers and make meaning out of them? Anyone have ideas? He has to understand the likelihood of positive cases. He has to know the total population of Kansas City to compare week to week, historical knowledge, Definition of high risk. Yeah, what is, what is high risk? What is low risk? What should the numbers be in those categories? If he knows when his symptoms started, they could go off of that. If he had symptoms. Mm -hmm. 
if he's just trying to assess whether you know what his community numbers are and what his behavior should be there's so many skills involved so he has to put these numbers in context is the big missing piece here there's no context to telling someone there are 206 cases last week you know if you don't know the week before or this week or the trend in the past the number doesn't make sense he has to figure out how to compare them so i don't i haven't used this online tool but if there's a you know if there's a way to compare week to week to watch the numbers okay they're going down or they're going up that would be really helpful um, a simple post saying it's okay or not for people to go out. Exactly. So um, something that just says, here are your numbers. Here's what that means for you. So that's a great idea. Sup uh, supplementing numbers with very simple words um, to interpret the data and the numbers for people is key. Very important. Um, yeah, Carrie says wear a mask. So if they had showed the number and then said, this means you should wear a mask, you should not, you should avoid crowds, you should da, da, da. Or if the numbers are low and they've been trending low, it could say something else. Like it is safe to you know, go about your, your life or you know, in high risk situations such as X, consider a mask. Um, okay, and people are saying it's a lot, a lot to be able to understand. I would say, I would use say, say wear a mask. Yeah, wear a mask. Color coded chart explaining the chance of contracting COVID in certain situations. Sure, like here's, you know, here's a typical situation. We consider this high or low. Here's what you should do. So always connecting the numbers with what they mean, but then also that piece of what it means for you. What should your behaviors then be? Um, David says he might want to know where in town these cases were located. Um, I don't know if they give that granular level of data, but that would be really nice. <laughs> Avoid that section. There's a break. There's an outbreak right there. <laughs> exactly. So lots of really great ideas, and you're you're getting the gist of this. So because there's no context for these numbers, he interprets it that it's safe because they look pretty low on the chart. So he and his family go to the concert without masks. Unknown to Robert, actually the previous week, there had only been 100 cases. So cases are rising, but you wouldn't know if you just saw the numbers out of context. And Roberto's family members risk getting COVID. So again, real health implications for not understanding the numbers. And then we just have one more, skill, one more uh, task for Roberto, and then we'll move to the skills section. So his doctor says CDC recommends everyone get vaccinated, even if they've already had COVID. Roberto doesn't understand why he needs to get vaccinated if he just had COVID. I've heard this a lot. You might be hearing this in the community as well. He doesn't think he has a high chance of getting it or of getting really sick again. He's heard people have also had bad side effects from the vaccine, similar to COVID symptoms. He doesn't want to go through it again. So I have one last little poll here. He chooses um, not to get vaccinated because he doesn't think the benefit outweighs the risk. So I'm gonna launch one more poll for you. So what information from his doctor would help Roberto assess his risk regarding the vaccine? I'll give you a minute to think through the options. And it is, it should be multiple choice. So you should be able to choose different, uh, several of them. So we've got, for those of you who can't see the poll, we've got about five different um, 
types of information or maybe six that would have helped Roberto. And I see the results coming in. I'm gonna go ahead and end it there. There's kind of a, um, a variety, I'm gonna share the results, a variety of answers here. But um, the truth is it's all, all of the above. All of this information would help him assess his risk. Um, it looks like most people agree that the first couple would be the most helpful. So what's the chance of getting COVID again if I'm not vaccinated versus if I am? I think that would be probably a main question. What's the chance I would get serious side effects from the vaccine? That's probably number two, because we do know that he's concerned about side effects. So he needs to understand the risks and benefits to make this decision. And also the numbers related to both sides, such as his chance of getting it again, his chance of getting really sick. So the other thing about risk is risk can involve both emotions and logic. So the logic is helpful. The information is helpful. He clearly needs his doctor to explain the risks and the benefits here. In addition, there's a lot of emotion that goes into health decisions. He's been sick. He's still feeling sick. He's fearful. He's fearful of his own health and for his family's health. There's a lot of emotion. And so the doctor could address the information, but on, at the same time, could provide that emotional support and kind of that ear to listen to Roberto's concerns. That has also been shown to support people who are making health decisions based on numbers. And when there's a lot of information to assess, you know, which treatment to choose, um, that's another big one. There's a lot of percentages that go into that. You have this percent of chance of, you know, of um, you know improvement or being cured if you go with this versus this, but the side effects are this percentage and then they're lower for this other treatment option. It's a lot to assess and to balance. And so in addition to the numbers and the information, people need that emotional support. And we have another training we did um, previously uh, that does touch on that a little bit, um, helping people um, on the emotional side of health decisions. So I encourage you to go find that recording um, if you're interested in that one as well. So I think, yeah, I think that's, that's it. So things are not going well for Roberto. He has not been able to follow any of his discharge instructions. Um, so let's now look on the bright side for Roberto. Let's see what could have gone differently to help him follow through with these discharge instructions. And these are gonna be four strategies to help you explain numbers more clearly. Um, and Lisa, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, Megan. Um, okay, yes, we are going to look at, uh, we're going to imagine that um, health, literacy, health literate numeracy and risk strategies had been applied um, with the help of a community health worker or CHW at each step of Roberto's journey. So let's see what that would look like. Okay, um, here's some strategies to improve a reader's understanding of numeracy and risk. Um, and the first strategy is to do the math for readers to use visuals with numbers, to give numbers meaning, and to explain risks and benefits. And let's go through each of these to see how they could have helped Roberto. Okay, so we've seen these discharge instructions and let's walk through each of these again. So we'll start with picking up his medicine from the pharmacy. All right. Our first strategy is to do the math for readers. This prevents readers from having to calculate the numbers themselves. Um, Roberto goes to pick up his medicine from the pharmacy. And this time, you know, he, he doesn't get it, but this time after leaving the pharmacy, he calls a CHW he knows because he's really confused about the cost. 
And so the CHW helps him kind of talk through his deductible, the coinsurance, and what he will owe. And she explains exactly what each number means and kind of shows him how to do the math. Okay, so you can see, you know, the original cost of the medicine was $175. And then you take that times 20%. That represents his coinsurance or the, the amount that he has to pay out of pocket. And they come up with the amount that he owes, which is $35. So knowing that, Roberto pays the $35 and takes his medicine home. Okay. And here's just another example, just to kind of reinforce the example of Roberto. Um, let's say you're telling consumers, you know, how much weight they need to lose. Um, so instead of saying lose 5% of your body weight and forcing people to, to, you know, figure out their own weight and then figure out, you know, what is 5%, um, you could create a chart that kind of does the math for them. And on the left-hand side, you can see, you know, if your weight in pounds is, you know, any of these weights, well, then here's the number of pounds you need to lose. So for instance, uh, if you're, if you weigh 160 pounds, you would need to lose about eight pounds. Okay. So we want to hear from you again. Um, could you use this strategy of doing the math to help consumers who you work with understand the numbers that you use with them? You had already kind of told us some of the numbers that you use. Um, try and think about if doing the math for them would, you know, might help them. Okay, You're saying yes. Can you give us an example of how you would use it? Okay, Annette says, I taught my students to try and do everything in tens and go from there. Okay, showing them how you arrived at a number, also send them home with it written out in their language. Great. Yeah. So these are good strategies. Oh, people use their 10 fingers all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like in this, the, the pound, the weight chart that we have, it doesn't tell exactly, you know, how many pounds, but just give them sort of, you know, a, a range or the, the most obvious numbers, and that will really help them figure it out from there. Okay, great. So um, he was able to pick up his medicine. Now let's go on to keep an eye on your new oxygen tank and call if it needs to be refilled. Let's see how we can handle that. So these are the instructions that he got and we can see it's you know lots of text and a very faint kind of black and white um, illustration. So instead, um, to kind of help out, the CHW or community health worker could maybe, you know, highlight that important information, call the oxygen tank company when the tank reaches 30%, um, could give additional instructions, and could actually, you know, maybe I don't know if the community health worker would be able to do this, but certainly the oxygen tank company could use a better illustration that shows, you know, in red, here's the point where you need to call us and give those, those extra instructions there in the circle. So using these enhanced instructions, Roberto knows when his tank is low enough that he needs to call the oxygen tank company. All right, here's another example of this. Um, this is just a little, you know, text about 
people who have volunteered for clinical trials and their percentages here, 81%, 97%, and 91%. And this material has used these little donut charts um, that are colored in with the percent. And that just gives a little visual indication for people of how much these percentages uh, represent. Okay, so he has filled, he has learned how to fill his oxygen tank. The next strategy is to give numbers meaning. And uh, let's see how it can help Roberto follow the next instruction on his list about wearing a mask in public. Okay, so here's that dashboard again. And we talked about how these numbers, you know, 206 total cases last week, and the number of cases per week is at 106. That's the number of new cases is 106 on the little chart thing. Uh, Roberto didn't have the context to understand these numbers, but luckily his CHW has been following the numbers and can explain it. The chart numbers on the bottom right show that currently the new cases per week <clears throat> is 106. And then here's the chart from last week. And they can see, if you look at the bottom right there, the, the new cases per week last week was only 86. So they are comparing those and they can see that hmm, new cases have gone from 86 to 106 in one week. Um, helping Roberto compare these numbers so that he understands that COVID cases, new COVID cases are rising at the moment. Um, he decides, yeah, I think my family and I should wear masks to my daughter's concert. And so here's, here's our chart, same chart. But you know, not everybody is lucky enough to have the CHW who can be there to help them interpret. So um, what are some ways that the website, uh, the dashboard could make some changes here to also help people interpret these numbers? Go ahead and write any ideas you have in the chat. Can you think of any? It's fine if, if not. Okay, let's just go ahead and show um, kind of what we thought of. You'll notice, first of all, here over on the left that um, the total cases of week, uh, uh, the total cases of last week um, is in red. And we've added a little thing that shows, you know, that, oh, hey, the number, those numbers are up about 100%. Um, somebody said, uh, Patricia said, brief explanation of what the numbers mean. Yeah. It always helps to have some text to explain or describe what the numbers mean. So good one. You also notice that over here um, on the right, they made the little, the last couple of numbers in red. And then like Patricia said, um, they could add some text that says, cases are rising in your area, protect your health, wear a mask indoors, avoid crowds, stay up to date on your vaccines. And so they're not only kind of helping interpret the data, but they're giving people the actions that they can take to protect themselves. So with help from the CHW, Roberto can see that, okay, the trend is that cases are going up, but they're still relatively low. And he can kind of see that from this chart. Um, so he decides to go to his daughter's concert and sit away from other people as much as possible and will wear a mask. Okay, here's another example of giving numbers meaning. 
Um, readers will better understand numbers if you, you know, put them in context using visuals such as this green trend line in the graph on the left um, and in the colored bars in the graph on the right. Um, you can also include labels such as the descriptive titles for each graph, diabetes control chart, and expected deaths from melanoma per year. Um, the uh, other thing that you can do is to interpret the numbers using plain language text, such as in, in the chart on the right, you can see they've labeled at the bottom, you know, these three numbers are excellent, these numbers are good, and these numbers mean that they suggest that you take action because uh, those numbers are not as good. Um, they should tell what action they suggest. But the other thing I wanted to point out on this chart, this diabetes control chart, is that they've used colors to sort of indicate, you know, the green zone to us here in the United States um, means green means good, yellow means caution, and red means danger zone or something like that. And if you are writing, if you know your materials are for just a, a US audience, you know, those, um, those colors can really be effective in helping people see things at a glance. But we would exercise caution um, because these colors can mean other things in other countries, um, in other cultures. So, you know, in China, red means luck. Um, so those wouldn't, you know, necessarily uh, communicate, you know, danger to other people. Okay. So Roberto, he has done the first three things on his list. Now let's look um, about getting vaccinated. And Roberto's doctors sort of use this vague recommendation for getting vaccinated. Um, Instead, she could have really explained the risks of not getting the vaccine and also the benefits of, of getting it. She could have told him that the evidence showed um, that getting a COVID-19 vaccine after you recover from having it provides added protection to your immune system. And people who have already had COVID and do not get vaccinated after their recovery are actually more likely to get COVID again than those who get vaccinated after their recovery. So um, luckily, Roberto's CHW fills in the gap and walks him through this information. If you don't get vaccinated after having COVID, you're more than twice as likely to get COVID again compared to someone who was vaccinated after having COVID. So that's really important to know. And she tells them, you know, you're right that getting COVID again is less likely, but that only lasts for a few weeks to months after you get it. Some research shows that after a few months, you might have no protection left against COVID. At this point, they're really not sure. If you do get vaccinated and get COVID again, your chances of having severe symptoms and being hospitalized are much lower than if you don't get vaccinated. So taking all of those facts together, um, Roberto decides, you know, okay, uh, I'm convinced. He decides to ask his wife if she will go with him to get COVID vaccines. Um, they still haven't really decided about getting their children vaccinated, you know, but at least they're considering it and they will have had the experience themselves of, of getting vaccines. And hopefully they you know, won't have um, pronounced symptoms. And I just wanna add to that, Lisa, mm -hmm. I kind of mentioned this before, but um, one of our previous trainings that we did in this training series was on um, motivation and motivational interviewing, how to help people make these health decisions. And I know that someone in the chat said um, people, uh, struggle with the, the risks of getting their children vaccinated. And so kind of related back to my comment about the emotions underpinning these decisions, we have a whole training on how 
to address the emotions underlying people's kind of ambiguity, their hesitancy, um, to, to help motivate them towards a decision, hopefully the healthy decision that we would support, but um, to a decision that fits with them nevertheless. So check out that training if you weren't able to attend. Yeah, good, good thoughts. Okay, and here is just a helpful hint to help explain risks and benefits. It's to use natural frequencies with percentages. So a natural frequency is like you can see on, on this little um, graphic here, only one out of 20 people with cancer take part in a clinical trial. So, you know, if you, um, some people have a hard time with percentages, some people may have kind of a more emotional reaction with natural frequencies. So we always advocate for using them both if you can. And so, for example, you know, 5% and then in parentheses, one out of 20. Um, so that's a good way to, to make sure you're covering all the bases. All right, so we have made it through all the instructions from Roberto's doctor, uh, but this time his community health worker used health literate strategies to help him understand the numbers and risks involved in his health decisions. And yay, he checked off each one. Uh, his health outcome looks a lot brighter because he was able to understand and follow all four of these instructions. And, you know, again, we want to emphasize these are, you know, there's a lot of emotion involved. Um, using health literate strategies doesn't guarantee that people are going to change their minds, but it does make sure that their health, the health decisions they ultimately make are better informed if they understand um, the numbers, the risk, and, and all the other things that go into making these decisions. So um, once again, you know, these are the strategies that, that we just talked about. And we're wondering, um, have you used any of these strategies with consumers? If so, which, which ones? I know it's hard to kind of think back about all the <clears throat> all the information you give out, um, but if anyone can think of something that they've used, okay. Grace said we use visuals with numbers on our COVID nineteen education handouts. Great. Yeah, visuals really help people. Good. Yeah using visuals. Giving numbers meaning, explaining risks and benefits. Yeah, explaining the benefits, um, you know, gives really motivates people. And, and that goes back to the uh, webinar, the training that um, Megan has mentioned, talks about giving people the why they should do something. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question. What has been challenging when explaining numbers or risk? Um, Annette says, I have them repeat back to me what they, what they believe I have told them. Yeah. Using teach back method. That's great. That helps you confirm that they have understood what you've told them. And we are right at 11 o'clock. Um, Lisa, if you click two slides, um, two slides down. Yeah, here's a list of resources. Oh. Um, yeah, back one. The, the last one, the Clear Communication Index, I wanna highlight because it's an actual tool you can use to assess your information. And there's a section on numeracy. It basically is just these strategies, but it's a good tool, it's a good reminder. So I highly recommend that one. Um, and as we mentioned, we'll be sending out a summary of this training that has these resources listed on it 
to, if you are interested in doing a little bit more digging, CDC also has a website with a lot of more like research and background on new numbers and um, kind of prevalence data around where people are uh, with understanding numbers. So if you're interested in digging into the research, that's there on the CDC site as well. Um, and then our, our next training is going to be around culture, considering culture in health communication. And so we hope that you join us for that. Um, that is going to be, I don't have the date right now, but it's going to be the last Wednesday, I believe, in May. So thanks, everyone, for participating today and for for listening. And May 25th, Taylor says. Okay. So please join us for that training on May 25th. And we hope to see you there. Thanks again, everybody. And please fill out the survey that we send as well. Hope you have a great rest of Wednesday, your Wednesday. Thanks, everybody.